Let's get into Labor Day related coverage now, and I'm bringing back Umberto Fontava, Fontova, who was on the show for the first time last week, and we're going to talk about something that clearly is not going to be talked about at government schools related to Labor Day, and this is the labor movement in Cuba, which is kind of ironic given how uh, Che Guevara is often uh, an icon to people, the forces of so-called organized labor. Uh, there's a great article at townhall.com from 2012 that he wrote uh, called uh, Che Guevara and Chicago, or I may have it backwards. And anyhow, let me bring on Umberto Fontova to uh, share with you uh, some thoughts about things you're not going to hear about from the media or the educational system. Thanks for joining me, Umberto. Okay, thanks for the invite, amigo. It's it's really not just a Cuba case. I mean, this happened under yep. all communist regimes. I have to keep reminding myself that the Iron Curtain fell and an entirely new generation has come up that basically doesn't know what communism is. The first thing that communism does in all communist countries, from Poland to Cuba to wherever, they attack organized labor in Cuba. Organized labor form the bulk of the armed opposition to Fidel Castro and Che Guevara. In other words, workers form the bulk of the armed opposition to the idols of the international left. Think about that. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> it's, uh, I'm here to tell you, prior to Castro's revolution, Cuban workers were more unified, were more unionized as a percentage to the population than U.S. workers. See, that's why they had to go after them very, very early in the game, because Cuba had a very strong labor movement uh, affiliated with the AFL-CIO, the time the gentleman, the head of the Cuban Confederation of Workers, a gentleman named Eusebio Mujal. He was like Cuba's version of George Meany, who used to run a fish, virulent anti-communist here mm -hmm. in the U.S. And he had to flee Cuba the day Castro and Che took power. So he was basically in the situation that uh, Fredo Corleone and uh, Michael Corleone were in, leaving that day. Yeah, that day he had to flee Cuba because, as is the case with so many Union people, when they're young and, you know, kind of foolish, they were themselves communists. Because uh -huh. let's face it, I mean, it's it's one thing to be anti-communist nowadays in the 40s, but in the 19-teens and in the 20s, nobody knew how it would turn out, really. Right. You know? And so a Tens lot of people... Tens of millions of people, people later, I just have to emphasize that. Tens of millions of people killed later by communism. It's a little bit different. Yeah, yeah. Revenue. I mean, it, all you've got to do is figure out what countries people try to leave and which ones they try to get into. But Eusebio Mujal had been a communist uh, in the 20s and the 30s. So he knew who was backing the Castro movement. So we had the New York Times, and we got everybody, oh, no, he's not a communist. He's this and the U.S. State Department and the CIA, folks. Yep, the and I have CIA to emphasize New York Times. Back Castro to the hilt, to the hilt. Walter Durante's paper. you got to have people Google Walter Durante any chance you get so you can hear about his relationship with communism. But please go on. I just had to add that. Right, yeah, Walter Durante, but I mean, there was somebody worse than Walter Durante. Oh, there Herbert was? Herbert Matthews, Herbert Matthews, who reported on Castro. He started reporting uh, from Cuba in 1957. He was the one, as a matter of fact, there's a, a book titled The Man Who Invented Fidel Castro. Herbert Matthews of the New York Times. Fidel Castro awarded Herbert Matthews. In April of 1959, on a visit to U.S., Fidel Castro awarded Herbert Matthews a medal. There's pictures of it in my articles. You can Google it up. He said, without the help of hmm. our friend Herbert Matthews and without the help of the New York Times, the Cuban Revolution would have never been. Okay? And the funny thing is the New York Times probably isn't even embarrassed about it even today. 
No, no, and this was this was 59, and they're still at it. I mean, you would think, okay, it's one thing to have been wrong about Fidel Castro in 57, 58, mm-hmm. 59, but no, they were still banging the gong for Fidel Castro. They're still doing it, as a matter yep. of fact. You know, they were championing uh, Obama's policy, a complete, utter, complete disaster, total mm-hmm. disaster, and they're still backing it. But this guy, it was Sergio Mahal, going back to him, he had to flee Cuba because, see, Fidel Castro and Che Guevara's movement, the July 26th, but when they were rebels, they declared a general strike in Cuba. You mm-hmm. see, that's commies love to do that. In April of 1958, they declared, okay, all Cuban workers, because you're being horribly oppressed by Batista and the bourgeoisie, and you're being horribly oppressed by these people, we're going to go on a general strike, April, and we're going to depose this dictator and this oligarchy. That is a complete and utter failure. Nobody went on strike. Nobody, the workers back Batista, lock, stock, and barrel, with a few exceptions. And uh, and so they knew, the communists knew they had to go after them right off the bat. And Eusebio Mahal fled into the Argentine embassy January 1st of 59 because mm. the communists were coming after him. So it's the same story in Cuba as it sounds like everywhere else. You get activists, intellectuals who like to fancy themselves workers or revolutionaries, whatever, and the people actually doing the work, whether it's kulaks in uh, Russia or the Ukrainian peasants, obviously a lot of them were considered kulaks too, the people who actually spend their days working, especially with their hands, uh, aren't so into them. And uh, it's you know, and it's typical Marx wasn't a worker, but uh, Marx was sat in the library all day, and uh, as opposed to Eric Hoffer, who was a longshoreman and wrote a very good anti-communist book. He was an actual worker. Uh, but it seems like the same story everywhere. The longshoreman philosopher. Yeah, you can learn a lot more than you can from him. But like I say, it's uh, and it's going on right now in Venezuela. The identical thing is going on, so you would think – Okay, let's give them a pass in 1957. They didn't really know what was going to happen in Cuba. But, folks, it's a little late in the game for that right now. Mm-hmm. Okay? So, when you see people in Chicago, this was a few years ago when they were having the big uh, union strikes. The, the teachers' unions were mm-hmm. striking in Chicago for some reason or another. I forget this. Exact, but they were wearing, during the strikes, they were wearing Che Guevara t shirts. Yep. And waving we should- Che Guevara. We should emphasize that this is a public sector, white-collar union as opposed to a uh, more blue-collar union. I've yeah. noticed the difference in Philadelphia, where I'm from, between people who are government workers and especially teacher educators, as I call them, teachers, versus guys who are electricians or steel workers or something, who tend to be a little more conservative, who tend to be a little bit more manly men. Uh, and that's something that I think has been true throughout history. Civil servants tend to be much more left wing, uh, left wing, and more likely to wear a Che Guevara shirt. Always. So here they are waving the banner. Union members waving the manner of a totalitarian Stalinist, who is on record as saying Cuban record Cuban workers cannot go on strike. They must learn to live in a collectivized society, and anyone who would go on strike would either get sent to prison or in front of a firing squad. Mm-hmm. And this is the idol of the Chicago Teachers Unions. You cannot make it up. You cannot mm-hmm. make it up. No, you can't. I mean, and, well, I'm not, don't get start, not going to get started on the teachers unions and the kind of people who are in them. And it's just scary to think what they're telling American kids, which is why they would never learn about this stuff in American high schools. No, and that, that was the whole point of my, uh, my book. The, that's why so many things about Cuba, like I say, the, the things that most of us are hearing from the mainstream media, the fake, of course, the fake news media and the mm-hmm. professors and, and the, even the History Channel and so forth, it's not that they're just wrong about Cuba. It's that they're the opposite yep. of the truth about Cuba. It's the opposite, and it's because Castro has been cultivating the Castro regime from day one, since they were cultivating the New York Times in 1957, and as Che Guevara wrote in his diaries, he said, much more important than guerrilla recruits for our army 
were U.S. media recruits to spread our propaganda. And, and that is why well. so little is known. It has worked like a charm. And you would think that 60 years on, people say, hey, you know something? They turned out to be wrong. Hey, you know something? They're blowing all kinds of smoke in our ear. But no, it's very rare to see that kind of thing. No, it isn't. And, uh, you know, I, I saw on Babalu blog, for which you write, people should check it out, just how someone like Diane Sawyer gushed over Castro, and it seemed totally genuine. And he was smoother. He was more charismatic than, say, a Kim Jong-un, someone who's in the news right now. And it's worked. It's just it's very scary. Cool. And he, he twice, twice tried to incinerate New York City. First, during the missile crisis, mm -hmm. when uh, Che Guevara went on record. He said, if the missiles had remained in Cuba, we would have fired them against the heart of the United States, mm -hmm. including New York City. He said that in November of 62, just two or three weeks after the missile crisis, he thought he was talking off the record to the London Daily Worker. So he tried to obliterate them. Now, a year, a few weeks later, Thanksgiving of 62, J. Edgar Hoover's FBI. Hey, folks, there was a time when FBI actually did their job, you know. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, J. Edgar Hoover's FBI uncovered a plot. A terror bomb plot. Here were the targets, folks. Macy's, Gimbel's, Bloomingdale's, Grand Central Station. Okay? These were among the targets. 500 kilos of TNT were going to be set off in these targets. And here was the date, the day after Thanksgiving, yep. the busiest shopping day of the year. Jagger was rounded up. It was a Cuban plot. It was a fair play for Cuba committee with Castro's uh, diplomats at the U.N. involved in this plot. So twice he tried to incinerate Manhattan's best and brightest. And they gave him a whooping, hollering reception in 1996. Yeah. Ed Rockefeller, Mort Zuckerman, Diane Sawyer, Dan Rather, Mike Watt, everybody lining up for his autograph. <laughs> oh, All right, I got to let you go. I got to add that Castro has spent a lot of time in Manhattan when he was young. I think he did some of his education there, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I, I have that right, right? The, the, the vegetation. Education. He did some of his education there. Oh, like no, no, there. no. He, no, he, he visited New York. He, as a matter of fact, he went there uh, on his honeymoon, very short uh, period of time and so forth. But no, he was educated in Cuba um, <laughs> by the Jesuits that luck would have it in yeah, high school. Not that surprising. But Castro uh, <laughs> is not exactly a, a son of the working class. We'll leave it at that. And oh, I no. think the, a good summary here before I let you go is that uh, look, the people who get screwed most by communists uh, often tend to the people who do the most work, whether you know as farmers or in uh, the industries. They are the first to pay the price for workers of the world unite, ironically enough. Any final thoughts on Labor Day, Labor Day before I let you go, Umberto? Uh, what you're saying right there makes sense. Just think about it. It's those kind of people who can see through BS, right? Mm -hmm. It's those kind of people who won't stand for a lot of BS. People who work with their hands, look, give it to me straight, buddy. I like a straight shooter. So those are the ones who like, often see through commies before the intellectuals do, right? Because the right. common man, I work with my hands, I want a paycheck, they can see through these frauds like Castro and Che. Love it, love it. Okay, people can follow you at Babalu blog, B A B U, uh, no, B A B A L U blog, uh, dot com. And also you're on Twitter as H F O N T O V A. I finally got that right. And yeah. uh, any other places people can follow you, uh, Umberto? H Fontova, my website, everything that I write, uh, I write weekly columns for Town Hall and, and Daily Collar and Front Page Magazine. They're all on my website, H Fontova. But if you put either Umberto with the H in front, or Fontoba, my website's the first thing that comes up and everything I write is there. All right, enjoy the rest of your Labor Day weekend and thank you for coming on Backlash. Okay, buddy, anytime.